we're making a differential diagnosis of why countries get stuck with very bad economic performance. We've looked at how poverty traps can hold poor countries in a grasp, preventing them from making the basic investments to move forward. We've looked at how physical geography, the presence or lack of fossil fuels, the proximity or distance from the coast, the uh, nature of the climate system can shape economic development. Very often people turn first to culture as the explanation of why some places are ahead and others behind. It's often quite glib because rich people like to say we're rich because our uh, culture is better rather than to say we're rich because we have uh, lots of energy resources, good coastal proximity, and a healthy climate. And uh, rich people often like to blame poor people for their problems, say, well, they're, they're lazy, they're not working very hard. And throughout history, places that were once poor and they became rich were known, quote unquote, as lazy places during their period of poverty. And then once they became rich, their culture was used to explain their hardworking uh, ethos. Uh, so culture can be a bit of an optical illusion, a little bit too easy sometimes uh, as an attribution or a cause of uh, a country's conditions. And we should remember that cultural phenomena, uh, people's beliefs and attitudes, uh, their views towards their appropriate roles in society, change over time as well. So culture isn't a fixed monolith. I believe culture has a role, however, though not as big a role as is sometimes thought. And we should focus on those attributes of a society's values, its norms, its attitudes, as ways that can be promotive or barriers to sustainable development. I want to focus on three. Uh, one is on demography uh, and population, the second on education, and the third regarding gender. When we look at the population challenge, a good place to start is this world map of the fertility rate. Uh, the total fertility rate in a country, you'll recall, measures on average the number of children that a woman will have during her lifetime. It looks at the age-specific fertility rates for women in a society and then says if women age 20 to 25 on average have this many children, women age 25 to 30 have this many children and so forth, then on average over the course of a woman's uh, lifetime and reproductive years, an average woman in this society would have uh, this number of children. What the world map shows is the tremendous variation in our world today in the total fertility rate. In many parts of the world, especially the high income world today, fertility rates are below two. That means that each woman on average uh, is having fewer than two children. It means since half the children uh, are boys and half the children are girls, on average, uh, each uh, woman is having uh, less than uh, one daughter. Or if you say uh, 10 women uh, in total would be having fewer than 10 daughters. You can see that when fertility rates are below two, so that on average, each mother is not replacing herself in the next generation with a daughter, statistically speaking, that the population would tend to be stable or declining. When the total fertility rate is above two, then the population would tend over the longer term to increase. So if in the high income world on this map we see total fertility rates below two, we also see in some of the world's poorest countries, and notably in Africa and in parts of South Asia, total fertility rates above four, and in many rural areas in low-income tropical Africa, we have total fertility rates above six. That is a poor household uh, would, on average, uh, the woman would be having six or more children. This tremendously affects economic development. 
because with very large populations of young children, poor families have a very difficult time providing the basics for all of their children. Maybe just the eldest son uh, is able to go to school uh, and the girls are married at a young age or work in the fields without a proper education. And that means that in the next generation, those young girls will grow up without the literacy and the skills that they need to help uh, their own lives, uh, their own children, and uh, the national economy to be productive. So countries that have made a transition from high fertility rates to low fertility rates have tended to have an advantage in economic development. Countries that have still today very high fertility rates tend to have much lower economic growth. To a certain extent, this is a matter of income itself. It's not really a matter of culture. Uh, poorer families living on farms tend to have more kids and have less access to family planning, to contraception. The girls don't have access to schools and don't go to uh, school uh, and are married young and begin having children at a very young age. But to some extent, at least, fertility rates also reflect culture. Let's look at one example of a society that moved rapidly from high fertility rates to much lower fertility rates. That's China. They did that, by and large, through a government policy known as the one-child policy. And while it's been very controversial, notice the implications of this policy. What has happened is, in a very short period of time, family size has come down rapidly, and parents have invested intensively in their one or sometimes two children. And so that within one generation, the levels of education, health, nutrition of Chinese young population has soared. This played an enormous role in China's very rapid economic development. So some places, by virtue of culture, politics, history, have still very high fertility rates. Other places have made a rapid transition to lower fertility rates, and the record shows very clearly that those countries experience faster economic growth, better health for the children, and higher educational attainments. Over time, this fertility rate shapes the population dynamics, whether the population is rising or declining in overall size, and the age distribution of the population shown here by the uh, age population pyramid, so-called. What these pyramids show are the numbers of boys and girls or men and women at various ages uh, showing the age structure of the population. If you look at Japan's population, for example, in 1950, when fertility rates were still rather high, the number of children at the bottom of the pyramid was much larger than the number of their parents and far larger than the number of the grandparents. By 2005, the shape of that pyramid had changed considerably. Japan had reduced its fertility rates, partly as a result of culture, partly as a result of economic development, partly as a result of public policy. And so now the number of children were actually fewer than the number of parents because the fertility rate had come down below two. And the whole age structure, therefore, wasn't a, a broad pyramid with a big, big base of young children, but was now uh, much more uh, similar uh, in uh, numbers of population at all ages. By the middle of this century, because of the continuing low fertility rate, the population age structure will be an in inverted pyramid, few children, many more older people. And that's how the transition occurs when fertility rates come down. Most of today's very poor countries have that big base pyramid, huge numbers of very young children to be supported. How are they going to be educated? How are they going to get the health care and the nutrition that they need? Uh, only if today's high fertility countries are able through matters of public policy, 
cultural attitudes and so forth to help reduce those fertility rates. Uh, and the best way is through the voluntary choices of households who decide to uh, reduce the number of children so that they can invest more per child and help raise healthy and better educated children. Unless that happens, then the problems of the large numbers of children outnumbering their parents will continue to make very difficult the economic development of the poor countries. Another cultural phenomenon involve attitudes towards education. Some poor societies, even in a state of great poverty, by tradition, by culture, focused a huge amount of effort and attention on literacy. Korea is one such country. Uh, Korea, even when it was impoverished uh, in the middle of the last century, had a very high literacy rate. And there was always great attention in uh, Korea's uh, modern history to broad-based literacy. Well, that's a cultural attitude as well as a government policy. And it's done very well for Korea since the middle of the century and, and the terrible Korean War that took place and devastated uh, so much of Korea. In South Korea, we've seen some of the most successful economic development uh, ever attained, some of the fastest economic growth, uh, and with a uh, rather widespread uh, prosperity. A huge part of that uh, has been facilitated by this continuing commitment to broad-based, high-quality education. And indeed, this shows up in international test scores. What you're looking at here are the rankings on international testing in science and math. Where is Korea? Right at the top. It's not the richest country in the world. Uh, but it is right at the top ranks, number one or number two, uh, definitely in almost every uh, test and category within the top few countries in educational performance. This reflects not only public investments in education, but it reflects uh, parental uh, support for their children, urging their children to excellence. It reflects a culture that has long strongly valued education and thereby made it possible for Korea to become a world leader in technology and one of the fastest growing countries in the world. A third cultural attitude that deeply influences patterns of economic development are attitudes towards women. Do women have rights? Are women participating in the labor force? Uh, do women face massive discrimination? So gender equality or inequality also has uh, political aspects, uh, but culture plays a significant role. Once again, as with fertility and as with education, there are big differences around the world in attitudes uh, towards gender equality and attitudes towards women, uh, even in the physical safety of women from violence one can see the many, many ways uh, that this influences economic development. There's probably not a society in the world where women uh, uh, still do not face at least some discrimination. It took tremendous political effort, social mobilization, and a lot of courage of women to break through this discrimination, even in places today that we view as uh, close to gender equality, if not fully there. But there are many parts of the world, of course, where women still face profound, profound barriers to their economic participation, to their political participation, to their role in society. What are the consequences of that? A society that tries to run on uh, half its uh, brain power, on uh, half its human capabilities, blocking the role of women uh, in problem solving, in economic leadership, in a political role. A country that's running only on half its human resources is bound to fall behind countries that are empowering all of their citizens, women and girls, as well as men and boys. Countries where young girls may have one or two years of schooling, but then uh, because of lack of interest, lack of budget, 
a lack of family attention and effort, are forced to drop out of school, marry young, start having children young, do not have the productivity to participate in a modern economy, face a tremendous amount of poverty and suffering themselves, and by dint of that are likely to be raising children in poverty as well. Now this is an area where there have been huge changes, fortunately, in the right direction over the last 30 years, but by no means uniform. Look at this wonderful picture of the Rwandan parliament. It may surprise you to know that Rwanda's parliament is not only more than half women, uh, but has the highest proportion of women in its parliament uh, in comparison with the rest of the world. And women's participation in politics has soared uh, in Rwanda, and it is rising in other parts of the world, though still with the huge uh, inequalities and still uh, a tendency towards uh, men dominating political power. In Rwanda, you can see the wonderful benefits of this turn towards women's empowerment. Rwanda has made astounding progress in reducing child mortality. It's making big progress in improving education. Social conditions uh, have improved dramatically. And while there are many factors uh, that are contributing to Rwanda escaping the poverty trap, the role of women in the parliament, in my opinion, has played a significant role. Uh, not only are uh, these women powerful role models for uh, young girls uh, in Rwanda, and I think Rwanda's success uh, in uh, light of this experience is a very powerful message for countries that are still lagging behind. Don't try to develop with only half of your citizenry. Take the lesson that a country that is mobilizing all of its citizens, its girls and women, as well as its boys and men, is a country that's going to have more success in the 21st century.